All right. So, hi, I'm Mike Kainowski. I am the advisor for the Infant Radio Club at Cornell. So, I have a lot of involvement in ballooning with them. I was doing it before I was with the Amateur Radio Club, and then they all sort of figured out their advisor really enjoys doing balloons, and so they do too. Um, so, we do a lot of balloon launches out of Cornell. Um, I also like to chase weather balloons, and as I said, I was doing balloons before the club was doing them. Um, so I've been doing them for a while, about 10 years or so. Uh, I, I started out using APRS ISCE in my car, running Windows. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that as a Windows tool uh, for uh, receiving uh, APRS telemetry, putting it on a map for you. Um, it's okay, but it's somewhat dated. It's not maintained a whole lot. It's Windows, and I actually don't run Windows on my own laptop anymore. So that was getting to be inconvenient. Um, it doesn't do landing predictions during its event, which I, you know, we all really appreciate having. And where we live in the cornfields of around Ithaca, New York, uh, there's internet connectivity is not great. You know, I'll be on top of a mountain, I'll have great internet. I'll go in a valley, I'll have none. So having an offline capability, both for my maps to cache maps in the car, and also for predictions is handy. Um, there's no satellite view, it's just got open maps on it, and it's an APRS only solution. And I've had some interest in doing other protocols. So nowadays I use Chase Mapper in my car, which is actually for those of you who chase weather balloons may be familiar with it. It's part of the Project Horus suite of stuff that Mark Jessup was talking about this morning. Um, Chase Mapper uh, is, is really cool. It was originally designed for, for chasing weather songs. So a lot of us, I, I have an auto RX station at home. There's hundreds of them around the nation now. Um, around the world, you know, hundreds around the world now, uh, collecting weather balloon data every time they're launched. Uh, my station's one of them. Uh, and that data goes up on the web, but also if you're running Chase Mapper and Auto RX and a mobile setup, you can receive those balloons in your car and chase them. And so you can set up a portable Raspberry Pi in your car, basically, and, and use Chase Mapper. Uh, so it listens, the way it works is Chase Mapper listens on the local network, whatever that is, uh, for UDP traffic, local IP network. And so if you run it off a cell phone tether and you have another device attached to your cell phone tether, the, the two will talk. And so you can send payload summaries, which are basically things that's gonna plot on the map from any network attached device that's attached to your tether. Um, Chase Mapper is really cool because it has built-in prediction. It has offline capabilities for both map tiles and predictions. Uh, and it runs on Linux and is viewed from a web browser. So I brought you an example of a portable Auto RX and Chase Mapper solution. I mean, I, I used this in my car for a while. It's a Raspberry Pi with a RTL SDR plugged into it, a USB power brick, and a... Uh, a USB GPS dongle, and this is on a long USB extender because usually this is like sitting on the seat and I throw this on the dash so I can get a GPS lock. So this is an all-in-one solution for Linux in the car that then I can connect to this with a web browser on a tablet or my phone and run Chase Mapper. Uh, so, and in fact, this is running right now and it's receiving an RS41 weather sonde that I put 4FSK on that's sitting out in the quad out there. I just threw it down in the ground and it's receiving packets. And if you go to amateur.sondhub right now, you'll see uh, AD2EAT on the map. Um, and that's coming from there. That call sign one more time? KD2EAT. It's the only balloon you'll see in, <laughs> in Huntsville. So here's an example of what Chase Mapper looks like. Uh, you see the blue track is the history. You see it's got a balloon icon right now. That means it's ascending. If it turns into a parachute icon, that means it's descending. Uh, so it's a balloon icon. And then you'll see there's two predictions going out from it. One is the blue is a prediction that if it goes to altitude, bursts and falls down, there's where it's predicted to land based on the, the prediction parameters. The red one is if it bursts right now. So you've always got sort of where it should go and where it could go on the map while it's going up. Once it bursts and the icon turns to a parachute, you'll just see one prediction for where it's going to come down. Um, and Chase Mapper's predictions look astonishingly like amateur.sonhub's predictions, probably because it's all the same code base. Um, so there's a picture of my, uh, my Raspberry Pi running headless. I do have a few little mods on it. I didn't show you. Uh, on the front, I put a little 
one, one 0.9 inch OLED display. So for those with really good eyesight, um, this displays the IP address of the thing on it. And also every time it gets a spot, it puts the altitude on it and it scrolls down on this little tiny display. And in fact, it's so old that it's basically illegible now. I think the pixels are dying. And then I put a little push button on the top. If I press and hold this button for five seconds, it'll shut down the Pi just so, because I'm a Linux guy and I like to shut down Unix computers nicely. I don't just change the power. <laughs> so it's got a little, I'd be nice to my computers. They'd be nice to me. A uh, nice button to shut it down cleanly. Um, so I added those mods, which you really don't have to. You can just yank the plug if you have to. Um, so total investment on this is probably under 200 bucks. And, and although I did buy that Raspberry Pi before the prices went through the roof and the supply chain problems, but you can probably buy a clone and still do it for less than that. So here's sort of a, a functional diagram of what goes on in my car and what will be going on in my car tomorrow for our chase. Mm -hmm. I've got chase mapper running with a display and I'm gonna have a payload in the air that's gonna be beaconing three different ways. It's the RS-41 that I'm running is gonna be beaconing 4FSK, which I'll be talking about in a bit, and also APRS on 70 centimeters. So if anybody's got a 70 centimeter capable APRS radio in their hand and you put it on 432-500 right now, you'll hear it beaconing. Um, every uh, once a minute or so. Um, <laughs> I saw somebody grab something I thought maybe he's going to read. Um, so I've got a script that I call Kenwood to Chase. And what it does is it listens to the serial port on my Kenwood, which utters basically the APRS strings. And the Python script just rips those strings and turns it into a UDP payload summary packet, which it then broadcasts on the local network in my car. And the APRS spots that I get through my radio up here on the map. Um, through, my, uh, through the SDR, uh, I'm running a script called Horus Demod Live, which is the project Horus code that Mark talked about this morning. And that's a script that's pulling stuff off the software defined radio, decoding the project Horus 4FSK traffic and broadcasting that both to Chase Snapper for display on the map and then also sending it up to amateur.sandu. So when I receive packets, 4FSK packets, they go both onto my local map and they get sent up to the internet, if the internet's available. Finally, the last thing I have here is a low raw ground station. And here's an example of that ground station. So it's got a little low raw controller on it with an OLED display on it. And this is what we use for our bear launches. And I'll be talking about this a little bit later. But basically this receives low raw packets. And again, since it's ESP32, it has, uh, uh, Wi-Fi capability. So it's sending UDP broadcasts to my Pi, which will then get uh, painted onto Chase Mapper, and it also connects across the internet to amateur.sandhub. So if I receive a low raw packet from my payload, uh, this will gateway it onto the internet to both Chase Mapper and amateur.sandhub. And I'll talk about all the other bells and whistles on this box in a little bit. Uh, and then finally, um, one that I'm not running today, but I could, is another one called APRS to Chase, which I've written in the past, which basically pulls off the APRS network. So if I filter off of IP particular call signs, I can uh, paint those onto Chase Mapper. So even if I don't have a radio in my car, I could get APRS traffic into Chase Mapper so that I can look at it that way. Again, the purpose of this stuff is so that, and this one is a little silly because the, my real desire, I'm a little militant about wanting to be independent of having uh, internet capability. I might have a local IP network in my car running off my cell phone tether that can't get to the rest of the world, but they can still get to each other. Um, and uh, so I can still look at my chase mapper and follow a balloon, even if I don't have internet out in the cornfields. So that's my goal. But that last one, since it requires pulling data off the internet to receive APRS, eh, um, I'm not using it right now. <laughs> if I want to look at APRS traffic on the internet, I'll just go to imagery.com. So that's what I do with Chase Mapper. So this is sort of a lead in to the other technologies I'm using, but um, just because Mark didn't talk about Chase Mapper much this morning, and I don't know how many people use it, it's a great tool. And it's the same tool that you use to chase weather sounds or can use to use to chase chasing weather sounds. So for me, it's awesome because I can chase weather sounds with it and it's practice because you know, the first couple of times you go to chase a weather balloon, you kind of screw up a lot. And so you don't have the technology right or you know things don't work right. 
And so this gives me an opportunity to practice chasing weather sun. So when I get in the car to chase a hab, I've got a really good chance that all my pieces work. Um, so I, I like leveraging the same technology for more than one kind of chase. All right, so for FSK, um, and all these are bullets that were on Mark's foils this morning. It's got a great link budget, 10 or 15 to 20 dB better than APRS. So you can receive it really well. Um, it's got forward error correction. You can receive it with a cheap $20 SDR and an antenna. I mean, this works just fine. When I'm in my mobile chase station, I'll unscrew this and I'll plug it into a cheap mag mount on the roof of my car. But um, 4FSK is just a wonderful technology for chasing balloons. And you get uh, beacons really rapidly, about every four seconds. So you get really good data. And for those of us who've gotten the last beacon a minute before landing and then nothing else, and it's a full minute before landing, you know, that can be a big area, um, especially if it's wooded. So having it every four seconds can really make a difference, especially if you're landing in a wooded area and you manage to hit the ground so you can't hear the tracker. Um, so it's, it's a big win for that. Um, Obviously, the reception statistics go up on Grafana, which Mark talked about this morning, including signal to noise ratio for every receiver that receives the traffic. So again, that's pretty cool. Um, and finally, there's an open software implementation for the RS-41 weather sound. In my area, that's what they're using. So for me, free trackers fall out of the sky. All I have to do is go pick them up. Um, I know a lot of folks get the FM-17s right now, and I'm working with people on a port of this code to the DFM-17. I had hoped to have it done by now, but life happened last, last year, so uh, maybe next year. Maybe next year I can do a presentation demo, demoing it, work and both. So the challenges with 4FSK, there are a few. Uh, one is there's very few receive stations, right? APRS networkers receive stations everywhere. And if you can see your traffic, aside from all the weather stations on the net, um, you know, you, there's a lot of receive stations getting your balloon. If you're running 4FSK in the US right now, the receive stations are the ones that you set up. For me right now, I have one running at home on my base station and I've got decent elevation where my house is and I use my mobile station. And just with those two stations, I've gotten enough packets. When I've been chasing the last three halves, we've seen them landing. We've been there every time um, with just two stations. It's, it's reliable, not wood, um, and uh, gets great, great data. Um, each transmitter needs a unique frequency. So if you send, if you want multiple trackers on your payload for redundancy, for whatever reason, they have to be on different frequencies. We, there's the capability to time slot, but we haven't really played with that yet. Uh, I run uh, usually two RS-41s on my payload, either if it's a really expensive payload, I just want redundancy, or uh, the bear drop payloads, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Uh, we run two trackers because we're actually separating and dropping something off the payload. Um, so for those, I run them 10 kilohertz apart. And there's a Python script that you can set up that'll listen for one band pass and get in, and pull two trackers out of it. So you can run a script and just receive both trackers with one more SD mod live script. So that works fine with just one SDR. And of course, you need a computer to receive it. If you're still just depending on your D7710 in your car or APRS equipment in your car, um, you know, you need a computer in the car to receive this from the car. All right, so that's it for 4FSK. I, I know there were some questions about 4FSK. Are there any other ones about that before I move on? Then I'm not gonna dwell a lot more on it if, if nobody has questions. Cool. There were some other questions about why we're running LoRa. And the reason literally is because, because students wanna have fun. Um, so what we're doing is we decided to do these things called bear drops. The Cornell mascot is the big red bear. And we thought it would be fun to take a, a bear to the edge of space and return him safely. Imagine Kennedy with some kind of speech about that. Uh, to send the bear up to the edge of space, just before Apogee released the bear with his own little parachute, his own little tracker, and the students go chase the bear and recover him, and I go chase the main payload and recover it. So that was the objective for the project. And some of the requirements are that we want to use telecommand to release the bear. We want to send a signal so we can use a ground station to send a command up to cut the bear away from the main payload at, at the appointed time. We want to use you know, commercial off-the-shelf cheap hardware, and LoRa on ESP32 sure meets that. 
along with bi-directional communication managed by microcontroller and you know lots of exam example code and stuff to use. Um, I'm working with Cornell students who, I don't know where you guys find all your time. Uh, Cornell students, I mean, when we have our ham club meetings, you know, our ham club meeting is from seven to eight and at 7.59, they're all standing up to leave, even though they're having a great time because they're just so busy. So it's really hard for our students to find time for hobbies um, and, uh, you know, hobby time kind of doesn't exist for Cornell students. It's really, I, I couldn't be a Cornell student. Uh, I drank too much in college. Um, so really, I just couldn't do it. Uh, so, and also at Cornell, every activity you have, I don't know if you guys have this way, every activity you have in the university is directed towards something you can put on your resume. So we have project teams at Cornell. So, you know, we have project teams for UAVs and autonomous vehicles and all the rockets and all this stuff. And those are things that they get credit for and they put it on their resume and it's, you know, formal teams that they apply to be a member of. And I'm like, I'm the ham club, come play with us. Um, so we get the people who have time. And so they don't have a lot of it. So we have to keep our deliverables simple. So we're not doing really nice stuff. I'd love to be doing stuff for those. Um, so we keep it simple. So our hardware choice recently has been a TTGO T-Beam, if you're familiar with the SP32s. It's a, a simple little microcontroller that has GPS and LoRa built on it. So LoRa characteristics. There's cheap riser boards you can buy for it. It's a, a single vendor solution, so you sort of are locked in with it. Uh, most of those boards make 100 milliwatts where it can be dialed down. Uh, it uses spread spectrum <laughs> protocol. Um, it's kind of high bandwidth, not super ham friendly. The, the default is 125 kilohertz, so it's kind of a wide band. Um, and you need a low raw receiver to receive low raw. You can't receive it with any kind of radio. Um, it's got configurable forward error correction. It's got a spreading factor, which is basically how long each of the tones are, which uh, impacts how uh, well can be received. Um, the Cornell Space Systems Design Studio, we partner with a lot with the ham club. There's a lot of overlap and interest there. Uh, they're using low raw for an upcoming chipset launch where they want to just spray really cheap, inexpensive um, chipsets out. And they're collecting some very simple measurements and just have them fall out of the, the, the CubeSat and collect measurements for a short time while they're in the air. So they've been doing testing uh, distance testing to make sure they'll be able to receive these things when they drop from orbit. And uh, they did a recent test where they put a uh, uh, one of their chipsets on a balloon that went up from University of Maryland and they received it from Ithaca about 311 kilometers away. So they're pretty happy with the, the reception on that. So LoRa can be used over quite a distance um, and works great. So the LoRa protocol, I mean, it's a locked in vendor protocol, but what you send and receive on LoRa, there's no standard. It's just send a packet of data. So you can put whatever data in there you want. And so we put in you know, G, the, the standard tracking stuff, right? GPS, coordinates, temperature, checksums, serial packet, serial numbers, timestamps, all that sort of stuff. Um, the way we've set up for our bear drop software right now, the main payload beacons down every two seconds. And then right after that, we beacon back up to it um, just to avoid transmitting at the same time. Uh, and there's some exponential back off and retry stuff that we do if, if one's not here and the other. So the tracker, this is an ESP32 T beam. I don't have one example in my hand, but it's about that big. I mean, it's, it's not very big. Um, and so you see, you know, all the stuff that it's got built onto it. And what I did here is on the back of the T beam, it has a, a little socket on it for a, a lithium ion battery, one of the standard 4.2 volt guys. I just took the socket off and I did a little de dead bug. Um, Soldering, I put a little piece of protoboard on there and attached, uh, there's a FET on there and a temperature sensor and a voltage divider, and then just a whole bunch of connections for nichrome cutdowns for the bare stuff that we do. So that's the back of the tracker. Um, so it's, it's pretty extensible and simple to work with. So that's what that tracker you saw there is what goes up in the main payload. This is the ground station that the students are using. And so the idea is that we have these big nuclear drop buttons here. They put up the switch and throw the switch to tell the tracker to drop the payload. And there's some LEDs here that give status. Now I've got my payload booted over there. Let's see if it works. So if I tell it that it's a nichrome drop, it sends it a command to do a nichrome drop. It burns the nichrome for a few seconds. And if it hasn't crashed over there, eventually I get a blue light here that says the bear has been dropped. 
So that's positive confirmation coming back from the payload that it, it lit the nichrome, turned off the nichrome, and the bear has been cut away. Um, because we live in New York State, the other switch here is the cut the payload away from the parachute and I'm stuck in another damn tree button. And you can do that if it's below a certain altitude because we just decided we're going to abandon the parachute and we just want the box to fall out of the tree. And so we have a separate night curl cut down that we can do for that. Um, we've got a switch here called lock, which means um, right now on the, on the uh, uh, payloads, we have an automated drop at like 90,000 feet. If it hasn't received a cut down from us by then, drop automatically. But we can throw the lock switch and tell it, don't drop automatically. We don't want you to drop for whatever reason. <laughs> um, and it'll light up a little red light, which acknowledges that the payload says, okay, I heard you, I'm not gonna drop it. Uh, and then the last one, plug your ears, honey, there's a beeper in the payload. And uh, when it's sitting in a tree, I've got tape over the beeper. If it's sitting in a tree, we can tell it to beep at it so we can go find it. So this is the student's little uh, box. And, and you know, honestly, ham club students, their favorite thing in the world is soldering. So just soldering this up and you know, attaching all the pieces was a lot of fun for them. Um, so this is the little payload box that they're using. Obviously we can unscrew this and plug it into either a magmount on the roof or a Yagi. And so we can use that to sort of aim at the bear in the sky and try to get it to cut down to the right time. So that's the optimal situation. We haven't had the best of luck. <laughs> All that said, um, so previous attempts. The first attempt, bear drop one, uh, we named the, the, the Cornell mascot is named Touchdown. So Touchdown the bear was using DTMF tones instead of low rods. And uh, the signal just didn't get through, um, but the automated drop did fire. And we watched the payload drop, we thought, right into Cayuga Lake. We thought the bear went swimming with the fishes. <laughs> um, I got a call about three weeks later it landed right on some railroad tracks outside the power station on the side of the lake. And the guy whose job is to walk up and down the railroad tracks to make sure there's nothing there that'll cause a problem, found our little bear sitting right next to, on the shore where the railroad tracks were and called me up. So we recovered touchdown. <laughs> so we were, we were delighted that the touchdown was saved. I couldn't find the picture. I would have put it here. Our second one, uh, so we, that bear got to retire. Every bear after his flight gets to retire. We don't double jeopardy our poor little bears. <laughs> so the next bear field goal launched and he was on low rock. Uh, that one had a controller, controller failure. It just didn't seem to get the drop command. Um, but when it came down, we found that the automated drop had tried, but the uh, string, the bear was just hanging below the payload, had wrapped itself around one of the payload mount or the camera mounts. So the bear had actually been cut loose, but didn't fall off the payload box because it was all mm -hmm. knotted up. So we see here the bear in the tree. There's the bear. There's the parachute wrapped around the camera mount in our, our standard configuration on landing in New York State, which is in the tree. Um, <laughs> so number three was uh, home run was the name of the bear. You're going to start seeing a, a, a trend with the names. So home run was a, a, our next low raw. And the telecommand didn't work. We couldn't get through the command at altitude. The automatic drop they had disabled because they really, really, the students really, really wanted to initiate the drop themselves. So they hit the lock switch on here. So it didn't cut down by itself or it would have. Um, so they kept trying, kept trying. And at about a few thousand feet off the ground, I forget whatever, about a thousand meters off the ground, they finally got a command through as it was coming in for a landing. So the bear and the payload separated and they both landed in the same cornfield. So here's our students standing in eight foot tall corn mm -hmm. holding a home run. Uh, that's our president and our project coordinator for the M club standing there holding home run. Um, I felt so bad for them. They were walking around in the cornfields for an hour trying to find this. They were walking around with a Yesu uh, um, <laughs> radio. And I don't know if the Yesu radio isn't as accurate as the, as the, the Kenwood D72 or not. The, the, the tracker, this had one of these RS-41 trackers on it. It was beaconing 70 centimeter APRS. And they swear they walked right over it. They couldn't find it. So finally, after an hour of standing off, what letting them do it, let me go help. I walked out and walked right to it. You know, and they were about as far as, you know, away as we were here. And it's like, is this what you're looking for? And they were so bad. They'd been walking around out there for an hour. They, but they summoned a smile for the picture. Um, so finally, uh, Bear drop number four, we decided we needed mission patches. So this year, this last one, this, this past spring had a mission patch for, for Grand Slam. 
And we suspected that on, on number three, we had a failure because we think the microcontroller froze out. We didn't insulate it well enough. So we decided to put instrumentation on. So that's why the back of that board, I had a thermal couple. And sure enough, as it was going up, we noticed LoRa was telling, sending us the temperature data for the board and it got down to nine minus 40 and then it stopped transmitting. At which point I thought, well, you know, I don't like making two changes at once, but maybe we should have insulated it this time. Um, so the board trash. <laughs> so up it went and down it went and the, the bear was still attached to the payload when it landed. Um, so uh, they held up the payload and rebooted the controller and then did the cut down from the ground and the bear fell right off. It would have worked great. So number five, we're, we're trying to find a sports thing that does five point scores. And we had a couple in mind, I can't remember. I think there's a rugby one that does five points. Um, so anyway, that'll be the next mission um, in fall. So that's why we're using low rods, literally so that the students could code this and program it and use hardware that was, was accessible for them. So tomorrow what I'm doing is I'm taking the, the students ground station and the payload. And in my payload box, there's a ton of insulation around that TV. And I'm gonna launch it and just make sure that all these functions work at altitude because we wanna package up the same thing we did this time, this past spring in the fall and launch it when the students get back. And so if I test this and it works successfully tomorrow, um, then we'll know that yeah, we should have just insulated the stupid thing and it would have been fine. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. I'm going to be launching a low raw tracker and an RS-41 tracker. And my plan with my launch tomorrow is fire and forget. It's, you know, it's a foam box with an RS, uh, with a $30 TV and an RS-41 that fall out of the sky in our neighborhood. Um, and so if I lose it, I lose it. But if I can get it easily, I'll go pick it up. So, so that's what I'm doing tomorrow for my flight. So that's, that's why low raw. And that's all of my foils. Were there any questions? Yeah. On the low row, are you using the 433 We were using 915 previously. Uh -huh. And because we weren't sure if it was a signal strength issue or whether it was a uh, uh, just a thermal issue, the, the most recent one for, for flight three and the one I'm going to do tomorrow, or flight four and the one I'm doing tomorrow, we switched to 433 megahertz. So it's running in like. 431.5, or I found a, a low signal data band section of the band of the, the uh, uh, ARRL uh, band plan that would be reasonable for low rock. Thank you. What were those two frequencies again? 431. I don't remember. All. I think I put it around 431.5, but I'm not positive. I'd have yeah, to the other one, the APRS is 432. Uh, okay. Oh, what I'm using for 4FSK, my APRS is 432-500, and the 4FSK is at 432-605. Um, so it'll be deep on 4FSK for the whole flight. Can you decode, what are, what are options are to decode the 4FSK? Could you, I, I know like I'm, I'm using a, a low rod to decode the weather balloons. Right. Could, could that, be programmed to decode for FSK as well? No one's done it, probably could be. Um, the options right now are to either run the Python library, Horus Mod Live, or there's also a Windows application, which I've never run, which apparently is pretty friendly for it, called Horus GUI. And if you go to the Project Horus website, there is a, a Windows app called Horus GUI, which you can run, which will pull the traffic in. Okay. Is that Horus GUI? Yeah, or it's H O R U S GUI, G U I. And honestly, I've never used it, but every time I mention that I'm, I'm talking to, because I've got amateurs in our area, I'd like to get more people listening for Horus in our area for my flights. And Mark um, Jessup keeps saying, get them to use Horus GUI because it's Windows friendly. And if they don't know Linux, it'll be easier. And I'm a Linux guy and I never even think about Windows. So, but Horus GUI is the Windows uh, application to use for Horus K. I want to put more question about, about 4 FSK. You're transmitting four tones simultaneously. Yeah. And two, so two, two transmissions is one to uh, uh Probably plus or minus forward error correction. But yeah. And that's at 100 baud, I think Mark said. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. And I think.